From the land down under, with the rock at its centre, comes the little Aussie watchman. Unpardonable. Never-ending grace. There isn't a hole too deep or a mountain too high that God's grace can't get to. God's grace is everlasting and can cover any sin, no matter how big it is. You cannot outrun God's grace, no matter what. This is common Christian dogma, preached high and low across the Western world. Today I want to examine the claim of God's everlasting and eternal grace, and to try and marry it with some pretty controversial scriptures scattered throughout the New Testament. From 1 John 5. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin, however, that leads to death. I am not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. John is saying that there is a sin that leads to death, of which there is no point praying for. Really? Have you ever heard a preacher mention such a thing? A sin for which no grace can atone for? Just grasp that for a second. Have you ever heard that in church or by a minister of the gospel, that there is a sin you should not pray about? What about this clangor from Hebrews 6? It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Apparently, it is impossible for those who have sinned this way to be brought back to repentance. Yikes. I've never heard a preacher say that. Hang on. What? This is not eternal grace, not eternal forgiveness. Be careful, though. The intent of this verse hangs on the word repentance. If one cannot repent from their backslidden state, then they are unable to be forgiven. And then there was Hebrews 10. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. No sacrifice or grace is left, only a fearful expectation of judgment. Now that is a significant problem for those who have been taught that grace is forever. However, once again, the whole verse hangs on the word repentance. Only true repentance allows a sinner from ceasing to commit sins. If one repents and turns away from their sin, then they will no longer have to fear judgment. From Mark 3. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Okay. So this unforgivable sin is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 12, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. So how do we marry those verses warning of the unforgivable or unpardonable sin with the claims that all sin can be forgiven? It is simple. The unpardonable sin is that sin which a person hardens their heart against the promptings of the Holy Spirit to ask for forgiveness and show repentance. If a man does demonstrate repentance and seek forgiveness, he is not guilty of the sin to which grace cannot be applied. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is a permanent rejection of the Holy Spirit. Anyone who seeks God's forgiveness has not committed this sin. As Hebrews 6 claims, the unforgivable sin is for those who cannot be brought to repentance, despite the repeated promptings of the Holy Spirit. There is an unpardonable sin. It is when one cannot ask for forgiveness, cannot repent, and cannot turn from their wicked ways.